in one of the services that we had while we had the chapel open and we were meeting in person, um, Alex asked me a question because we always have the recitation of the principles of the metaphysical chapel of life. And we, if you look at the one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh one down of the eight, we believe that the Christ consciousness, the mediator, is the mediator between God and humanity. And Alex asked me the question, how do you define that? What is Christ consciousness really? And I had, I did not have a good answer at the time. And that bothered me and that stuck in my head. And so the way my Rolodex works, eventually it comes back up and there it is. And so I want to talk about what that really is and what that means, at least from my perspective, the Christ consciousness and how this actually fits into our daily life. So my intention here is to look at that look at what this is, look at how we actually can embody Christ consciousness, and therefore, how do we maintain that? How do we achieve it? In other words, how do we get there? And also a question of how strong is your faith? For when Bill puts out the newsletter, it's almost as if he is extremely clairvoyant on each particular speaker and what they're going to talk about. And it's uncanny. But in reality, I know it's just so particularly synchronous. So we have, um, I want to talk about this in this way. First of all, a definition of the Christ consciousness. And this is from a website called Operation Meditation. But it is a basic overview of Christ consciousness uh, on some particular points. It is a state of mind. It is understanding that there is a universal and omnipresent force everywhere and connecting with this higher power. So the Christ consciousness goes back to, you can think of that, we always think, of course, of Jesus Christ, okay, as a spiritual evolution, evolution elevation during his mortal life. Um, but anyone can become Christ conscious if they are open to the concept and seek to obtain this awareness and consciousness. Now, <clears throat> the important aspect of this, in my view, is that this transcends all religious doctrine and dogma, and so an ideology. So the Christ consciousness, again, comes down to a way of being and how to embody this particular path and this way of being. Most religious masters have walked a path of love and light, peace and harmony and bliss, generally following a period of suffering, becoming enlightened along their journey. This is not unique to any one of the prescribed religions, instead being a common theme amongst many belief groups. All people are capable of this enlightenment and awareness by opening their mind to higher possibilities. This is the Christ consciousness. And it is something that is embedded within many religions. If you look at, if you look at Islam and Taoism and Hinduism and uh, Buddhism uh, and the Essenes too, which of course is what I practice, and also with the teachings of Shintoism, which is um, which is uh, tied back into Jacob and Reiki, and it's something that I practice. And so you have this kind of running theme of how do we get there, what this is, and how do we embody that? How do we walk this way in the world? What's really interesting to me is the time we are talking about this. And I say that because are we stressed enough yet? Do we have enough stress at this point piled onto us with the virus, the coronavirus spreading, more people passing over? We have this election coming up. We have issues with our um, economy, people out of work still, places closed, all the other things, people trying to survive, trying to pay rent, trying to buy food, trying to go to food banks. You can name a list long as my arm, you know all this, and we still have this ongoing stress, which has actually been building over this time. All the important reason for embodying this Christ consciousness 
and becoming stronger in faith and becoming that lighthouse for other people to emulate and to follow so you can guide them. I've talked about this in this particular aspect of the chapel itself, that we are in many ways those leaders that can light the candle for others. And I can see your faces on my screen. I know exactly who you are and so do you. So you are there, you are the ones. But the Christ consciousness, again, aim is for people to become more loving, compassionate, tolerant, patient, forgiving, understanding and content by following a new way of conscious thinking by means, the means by which one achieves this is not important, but one should set the intention to become aware of this. Now, in some cases, of course, I have had to embrace this Christ consciousness in my own tolerance, where I see somebody at a store without a mask on, actually I saw one without any shoes and a mask, no mask, no shoes, Okay, and you just, I wanted to, I had to restrain myself thinking, should I grab him by the lapels? No, because that would violate the six foot distance between us. So I have to be tolerant and I have to be accepting. And maybe he just doesn't, can't afford shoes. Maybe he just forgot his shoes and he just didn't get the word about wearing a mask that it's important. So I have to kind of be very calm within myself. So it becomes a challenge. Um, meditation, of course, is an invaluable tool for quieting the mind and removing all thoughts based on modern day thinking and to allow inner reflection of, upon a higher purpose. It is a way of becoming aligned with a greater focus of nature and universal spirit. It helps people achieve ener energy and inspiration. And when you become awakened to become more Christ conscious, you can end your fear and your, your confidence does grow. You can trust in a greater power than the self and the person becomes their own master. They shape their own destiny. They become at one with the higher vibrations, whatever name they choose to ascribe to these vibrational phenomenon. So in this way, we can more easily rise above the fray and the din of everyday noise, conflict, and turmoil. There is a quote on Facebook I posted recently. I just kind of shared this. I didn't, I didn't write it, but it goes something like, you don't have to accept every invitation to, you don't have to accept the invitation to every argument you're invited to. So it comes down to, you don't have to actually engage in those kind of things to necessarily um, live your life. And so we, it's basically rising above, above all of this. But how do we get there? And so we have different aspects of this as far as how to work this and how, what is expected. We have with Islam, for example, performing the ritual prayers to keep connection with the creator, fasting during the month of Ramadan, keeping obligatory charity to the poor people to help keep economic balance in society, um, to revive the economy, performing the, the pilgrimage, uh, which is the Hajj. So all of those particular practices, with the Essenes, it is called the sevenfold peace. And as one of my guides had once said to me, be what you already are within yourself, which was something I had to deeply contemplate. Be what you already are within yourself. For we are, we are all masters or at least practitioners of this Christ consciousness as we walk through life. In Taoism, for example, you have the way. And what's really interesting here is, I'm gonna quote something from Taoism. If you walk by the way, you will be of the way. If you work through its virtue, you will be given that virtue. Abandon either one and both abandon you. Gladly then the way receives those who choose to walk in it. And gladly then its power upholds those who choose to use its power well. And so this has to do again, this way of being in the world, being tolerant, being that acceptance and being that connection with the divine and embodying that within our bodies. And in Taoism, the crooked shall be made straight and rough places made plain. The pool shall be filled and the worn renewed. The needy shall receive and the rich shall be perplexed. In Buddhism, 
the main texts of Buddhism, the Dhammapada, meaning eternal laws of the universe, and the path of harmony, which again goes back to the Declaration of Principles for this chapel. And the path is characterized by the Four Noble Truths. In life, there is much suffering, um, which is caused by living life in an inharmonious manner, characterized by the term uh, dukkha, which is like a wheel uncentered on its axle. And so you have it spinning uncentered on its axle, which if you think about that, for those individuals who do energy work, each one of the chakras is a spinning wheel. And for those clients that I see, we end up having that kind of imbalance is seen in the chakra. If there is a blockage within it, it will be off its center and it will not be spinning true. And so you have that as the same thing as suffering here. Suffering is caused by wrong desire. In other words, lusting after transient things. Egoist drive for personal gain at the expense of others or service to self. Suffering is only cured by trans transcending attachment to transient things, those things which pass away. And the path of transcendence is the eightfold path. The eight eightfold, eightfold path. And that's, of course, too complicated to go into for this particular lecture. We go into Hinduism, and the Bhagavad Gita is the main text for that, which again is the Song of God, and that actually has a uh, couple of common principles. Truth is eternal. Uh, we have the acceptance of the um, reincarnation concept in principle. And so we have that particular aspect of a common thread of trying to, again, maintain that consciousness, that's, that tolerance, that acceptance, and love for everyone. That's tough, especially with the stress that everyone is under. But it is also very important. It is also something that I have been working toward, and I struggle with this every day. For I have a process that I go through with my daily meditations, both in the morning and the evening, we have um, even a psychology with that, with the Essenes, and this is common also. This, this is nothing new, but it goes back to the idea that when you do your communions, your connection with the divine, your meditation in the morning, you want to do that first thing in the morning because what that will do will set in motion the forces that become the keynote for the whole day. They knew that a, the thought held strongly enough in the consciousness at the beginning of the day influences the individual throughout his waking hours. So the morning communions consequently open the mind to harmonious currents, which enabled him to absorb specific forms of energy into the physical body. So in the morning to set the day for yourselves. And then in the evening, the last thoughts of the day in the evening communion influence the subconscious mind throughout the night. And so you have this set process where you start to reprogram your thoughts and your mind and your way of being. I have struggled with this myself. It's been difficult uh, over times. And um, it's, all, it, it's always been a matter of how bad do you want it? It's like anything else. I remember um, a long time ago, and it has been a long time ago, back in high school, actually, I, was, I used to run track. Um, and I was thin, thinner. And, uh, and I was, you know, pretty good. But I was, again, in a, in a small agricultural county in Pennsylvania. And so I had set a couple of records there and went to states, you know, two years in a row and that, whatever. And so you get kind of blown out of states and you, you know, it's that one of those things where you can't compete with all of everybody there with, you get a bigger competition pool. I went to, um, I went to Penn state, uh, as an undergraduate and I went to the track coach there and I said, um, I'd like to join your team. And he looked at me and he said, okay, I'll tell you what you do. I want you to go run, I want you to run seven miles a day and come back and see me in a year. 
because I want you to build up your cardiovascular system. And he had the right approach and, hit, and what he said was absolutely true. But it was a matter of, I'm not doing that. I don't have the discipline to do that. I don't have the, the, uh, the will to do that. And so you have to kind of look at how bad do you want something. But to try to maintain and try to actually embrace that Christ consciousness is the key. And so we end up having No one's going to get that phone, so if you hear it, it's fine. Um, we actually having a maintaining a spiritual level and a spiritual discipline. There have been times also that I have had difficulty trying to maintain my routine. And at one time in the military, I was being faced with and I was involved in, as a matter of fact, Barb Moen would understand this, but when you have, you're on the division staff, there is something that comes up, which is once every two years for that particular unit called a warfighter exercise. And that becomes the report card for the commanding general. And I was on his staff. And consequently, after being up for two days in preparation for this, and they had changed, the, the individual combat commanders had changed the data again for the 17th time, and I had to go back to the computer to rework the spreadsheets, okay, for the order of battle for when we start. And it was an issue of, after being awake that long, a friend of mine looked in my eyes and grabbed me, said, fight through this. You can do it. Fight through. So it comes down to maintaining that connection with the divine, because that is what I personally have been devoted to. We go back to also yoga, and bhakti yoga, for example, is that, that yoga of love and devotion. Loving God, loving your neighbors, loving all creatures with all your heart and soul. Bhakti yoga, that love and devotion with the divine. That, again, is a cornerstone of all of this. But I do this in preparation for, again, the healing work that I do for my, my space, my client, and also for myself. There is, <clears throat> with the Jacob and Reiki um, uh, that I practice, there is a process by which you go through for that in practicing and connecting with that energy. And what's ironic enough about that is Shinto religion is this reverence for the ancestors. It is also, again, this connection to that energy of and again, reincarnation is a, is a common thread. It's like an assumption. It's like, of course it is. Of course you have reincarnation. You have this kind of process. What's interesting is that if you've ever seen um, the movie The Last Samurai with, with Tom Cruise, if you've seen that film, then you will know that Mikeo um, Yasui, who was a creator, he was actually a, a Buddhist monk at the time when he created and actually discovered the symbols and the principles of Reiki at that moment. He was living, he was seven years old at the same time that film was based. And where they filmed The Last Samurai was just over the ridge. It was a village just over the ridge from where they filmed it. So it's, it's that kind of an atmosphere and that kind of devotion where you have this acknowledgement of life in every breath and an appreciation of every single moment that we are alive and how we can interact with not only God and the divine, but also all of nature and all of you. And so this every single moment is that, is that gift that we receive. There is also a video that I send out to, one of, to some of my clients that talks about achieving a certain level of mastery. And a student talks to a master and says, Master, you've already achieved all of this enlightenment and this level of vibration. You are still doing yoga and meditation um, twice a day. What, why do you still need to do this? And he said, because I need to maintain 
this connection and I don't want to lose it. And that's how this works, of course. We know this. So all of this being said, um, it goes back to how strong is your faith? How strong is your spiritual path? How much have you invested in this particular path of yours to in, embody the Christ consciousness that is there for you? Especially during this time of stress in grounding and connecting and becoming a changed person, if you will, because we can actually change ourselves, reprogram our energy and our thinking. For a, until you change your thinking, you will always recycle your experiences. And that is a quote from Hiru Karet that I wanted to impart to you. Um, and also, let me see. And so that is something becomes a psychology of practice, becomes a purpose, and becomes a goal for each one of us to become better people and to help each other through this crisis. No more, no greater time um, is present that is you know, that our love and devotion and care for each other is needed in the world. This is the moment where we are needed to help others through this. So, thus ends my lecture. Thank you for your attendance and listening. <laughs>